morning, everyone. If you have your swords with you, do you have your swords with you? Amen. Amen. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to look at verse 27. Uh, one of the shortest verses we have in the scripture. By the way, do you know that if um, when you look at the short verses in the scriptures, those are always the most powerful ones. The shortest verse uh, in the scripture is Jesus wept. And that is one of the most powerful verses that we have. And in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 27, as you're turning there, the title of this message is, Are You a Demon Magnet? Is there something inside of you that just attracts evil? Is there something that is inside of you that just drives you, harasses you, torments you, and pushes you to things that are not of the Lord? Well, I think all believers would say, absolutely, there are things like that. We find that most believers are demon magnets, but there are certain areas, certain types of sins that the scripture talks about, uh, principles in God's word that he lays down, that when we get involved in those things, we open ourselves up to evil spirits or we open ourselves up to evil in our lives. And of course, these are areas that we should do everything we can to watch out for in our lives. Brothers and sisters, when, when I'm talking about principles of God's word, God's word may be laying down a truth uh, as in the story of the unjust judge who said he didn't fear God, he could care less about people, but because this widow woman came to him and said, hey judge, I got this problem, he says, I don't care. And the woman just said, yeah, but judge, you don't understand, I have this problem. And the judge says, listen, I don't care about you, I don't care about God, I don't care about anybody, I am a judge. And the lady just kept, just kept knocking. She just kept bugging him and harassing him. And finally, because of this, the unjust judge did what she wanted him to do. And Jesus said in that, in that story, he says, did you hear what the unjust judge said? Because what he said was, because this woman kept hounding me, I went and did for her what she wanted to because it was a, it was a harassment to him. That story, that principle of that story is that God wants us to harass him. God wants us to talk to him about our problems until they're taken care of in our lives. Brothers and sisters, if you have a demonic problem in your life, seek the Lord and seek the Lord and knock and, and keep knocking until Jesus answers your prayer. He wants to do that. Now, for whatever reason, he wants us to keep knocking. Maybe he's testing us in our lives. He's sovereign. He can do whatever he wants. But if you have a problem, you keep seeking the Lord. You do everything you can to find a brother or a sister that will pray real deliverance for you. If you'll continue to get deliverance, your life will continue to change. It's that simple. Good in, good out. Good in, good out. Bad in, bad out. It's all a matter of what we want in our lives. Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 27, not to give place to the devil. That word place in the Greek means residence. For us not to give residence to the devil. Have you ever heard the old expression, if you give him an inch, he becomes a ruler in our lives. And that's very true. Whatever, whatever way we open up our lives to the adversary, he will do what he can. The demons will do what they can. Even though they don't like each other, they have a goal and a purpose in, in trying to bring destruction into our lives. And so they will work together for that common goal. It's the same, it's the same mindset that happened principle when the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the Herodians and, and the lawyers and all these people got together that didn't like each other to do away with Jesus. It's an amazing thing how enemies can become friends when they have a specific goal and purpose in mind. And that's what the demons try and do in our lives. And that's why Paul warns us not to give place to the adversary because when we open up our lives unto him, he plays pile on in our lives. If you would, turn to 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5. The Word of God is a many-faceted diamond. This next story here that, that Paul is talking to Timothy about is concerning the care of widows in the church. But, the, but there are greater truths behind just 
the specific doctrine of how to take care of widows in the church. Again, the Bible is like a diamond, a many-faceted diamond. You take a diamond and you can look at it from different angles and it, and it shows a different sparkle which each, with each turn that, that you turn it at. And, what, and it's the same thing with the Word of God. It's the same diamond, it just shows a different facet. And so, um, and actually, specifically speaking of 1 Timothy chapter 5, we're going to look at verses 11 through 15. This is going to talk to us about witchcraft. This is going to talk to us about idleness, uselessness, uh, and us not minding our own business. Now, brothers and sisters, this, this idea of not minding our, our own business, of course, is talked about in Proverbs. The Lord tells us in Proverbs, by the way, if you want to know how God feels about things, read the book of Proverbs. Okay? God's heart is Proverbs. If, if you want to know uh, anything about how God thinks about situations, all we have to do is read the book of Proverbs. God tells us, I think it's over in Proverbs 24, somewhere 22 or 24, that when we meddle in other people's affairs, it's like taking a dog by the ears and yanking. In other words, we shouldn't do this. You know, we are not God's gift to other people. And this is very difficult for some because now maybe the Lord might put something on our hearts to talk to a brother or sister about, and that's fine. But what we have today in the church is, this, is again, the same demonic mentality that happened all the way back in the garden and throughout the Old Testament, even into the New Testament, where we read in Revelation chapter 2 when Jesus says, I hate the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. And that doctrine of the Nicolaitans is the control, the witchcraft that the leadership exercises over the laity or the little people, you and me. There are unfortunately many people in pulpits and in pews that feel that they are God's gift to tell you what to do. Brothers and sisters, all we have to do is look into the mirror of our own lives and there's enough for us to take care of that we don't have to worry about what our brothers and sisters are doing. It is not our responsibility to lead and guide our brothers and sisters. That is the job of the Holy Spirit. And we are operating in witchcraft. We are operating in mind control when we try and exercise our authority over other people. God does not want us to do that. Well, that all comes out of this story, this many-faceted diamond in 1 Timothy chapter 5. Paul was just laying down the truth of how to deal with true widows in the church. But he says here, starting in verse 11, he says, but the younger widows refuse. He says, in a, in a sense, he's saying, uh, don't put them on the list. He says, because when they, have become, uh, when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ, in other words, that their, their faith starts to slip a little bit, they're going to marry. Now, there's nothing wrong with marrying, but the truth, okay, we'll, we'll go on here to, to get to the truth of the story. Verse 12, having damnation or condemnation because they've cast off their first faith. Jesus Christ has got to have the preeminence in our lives. And... And in verse 13, he says, And with all they learn, now how do they learn? They're taught by Satan. We all are. Now that may come through different forms. It could come through school. It could come through a friend, a neighbor. It, uh, through m many different mediums, uh, uh, this comes into our lives. But he says they, are, they learn to be idle or useless or barren, the Greek says. They have to learn to do this. They wander about from house to house, and they're not only useless and barren, but they're tattlers. And that, that, a tattler is actually a person who is uttering or doing silly things. It's like they don't have enough going on, on, their, on in their lives already. Widows should be in the church. They should be doing what they can in the church, learning of the Lord, letting the Lord be their, their husband. Uh, and then it says in verse 13, and they're also busybodies. And of, and of course, that is, a, uh, that is talking about being involved in other people's affairs. But if you look the word up in the Greek, it also has a connection to occult arts or witchcraft. 
By being a busybody, we many times, by sticking our two cents into other people's lives, we do this mostly because we're trying to get an advantage over them. And that's where the witchcraft comes in. We're sticking our, our lives into other people's lives where it's not supposed to be. We are not supposed to uh, uh, influence uh, in a negative way, other people's lives. And if we're idle, the principle that is being talked about here is if we're useless or barren, if we're not out to help, we're out to hurt. Now, the only help that we can give people is going to be from the Word of God. And unfortunately, there's just a mindset today, especially in, in this new church that we see, of that love. We just have to love everyone. Well, it's true that we do need to have Christ's love for everybody. But today, because of our 21st and 22nd century, our 20th and 21st century thinking, uh, we, ha we have replaced this word love with feelings. And our, we cannot trust our feelings, brothers and sisters. See, we think when somebody is in trouble, the best thing to do is, you know, is to give them money. A lot of times, that's the worst thing to do. Now, there's nothing wrong with helping out people that need help. But, you know, some people are... I, I love to hear Christians sometimes. I, I meet many people, and uh, I'll hear... In fact, it wasn't too long ago I heard a brother say, he says, I live by faith. And I thought, no, you're a Christian sponge. See, what he meant by living by faith is that he tries to absorb off of other people. And then there are some believers out there. We have a young man who just recently left our church to do mission work in India who, uh, who won't even give us an address to send money to. He doesn't want money. He wants the Lord to take care of him. Now, there's nothing wrong with belonging to an organization that supports. We, you know, we want to help out in whatever way we can. He just wants the Lord to totally take care of him. That is truly living by faith. But there are a lot of people today that, that because there's so many, uh, uh, this new age, warm, touchy-feely Christianity that's being taught today, it deadens us from the seriousness of God's Word. We feel that, and this is how we interfere, and by the way, we need to be careful how much we interfere in other people's lives because if the Holy Spirit is in the middle of a work in that person's life, the Holy Spirit's going to have to move us out of the way in order for Him to continue that work. So sometimes when we're helping people, we're not really helping them. But it says here in verse 13, reiterating, he says, And withal they learn, they're taught by Satan to be idle, useless and barren, wandering about from house to house. And not only useless and barren, but also they're just doing silly things and they're busybodies. They're, they're especially busy about other people's affairs, the Greek says. And it also talks about magic arts and speaking things which they ought not. And Paul says, I would rather that they would marry, bear children, guide the house, and give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachably about them. And this is what happens when we get involved in other people's affairs, when we stick our two cents where it doesn't belong. Have we ever heard the expression, idle hands are the devil's workshop? It's very true. God wants us moving forward. Okay, if we're passive, if we stand still in Christianity, there is no standing still in Christianity. We are either going up or we are going down. There is no middle ground here. And so idleness, when we allow barrenness or idleness in our lives, it opens us up to the adversary. We then give Satan an opportunity to bring reproach into our lives. We become a demon magnet when we allow passivity to rule our lives. We become a demon magnet when we are just bound, that's a very good word, bound to stick our two cents into other people's affairs. We become busybodies at that time. And we start bringing influence into their lives thinking that we have the answer. We may have a part of the answer, but if we talk to people, I, as a pastor, I'm very blessed to have several pastor friends that, um, I'll, I'll just say this, you know, I, in, in some very difficult times that I've gone through in the last few years, I've, uh, not intentionally, but I've tried to hook up ungodly soul ties. 
I've realized that in retrospect. And I've got some very good pastor friends that have just kept me in the Word of God, that have just kept pointing me to Jesus Christ and not making ungodly agreements with me. We all do that. Pastors are no different, by the way. We're human beings. We want friends. We want people to agree with us. We want people to be like us. But we're not always right. And had these pastors formed ungodly soul ties with me, it would have been a detriment to me and helped to anchor home a demonic, uh, a demonic truth, because all truth, by the way, is not God's truth, a demonic truth in my life that the adversary would have used for me to justify an attitude or a feeling. But because these are good pastor friends, they've just kept me uh, on the word of God and always pointing me to Jesus Christ. And my point is, for all of us here, is that we need to do what we can to point people to Jesus Christ. He's the one that has our answers. We may have a little bit of the truth that we can share with people, but it is the Lord's responsibility. Jesus says, I will build my church. He calls it, number one, he says, he. Not the pastor, not us. He will build his church. It's not even our church. Everything revolves around the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we become idle or barren and not allowing the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives by doing these things, by going about and being in places that we shouldn't be and speaking things that we shouldn't speak, we become demon magnets. Verse 15, for some already have turned aside after Satan. Brothers and sisters, some, of course this was written 2,000 years ago, some, how about thousands, hundreds of thousands are turning after Satan every single day. I'm talking about those in the church. Now, I'm not saying that they, they, they've lost their salvation, but I'm saying that they've become barren, they've become idle, they've become unfruitful to the body of Christ. This is where deliverance comes in. Deliverance gets the demons out. It'll take a lot to keep them out. Getting them out really is, is fairly easy compared with the struggle of keeping them out. But if we're a demon magnet, we need to do what we can to get deliverance in these areas uh, that I'm talking about today so that we don't get caught up. Uh, if you would, turn to Galatians 1, Galatians 1, chapter 6, because I want to now talk for a few minutes about error and false doctrine. There's enough error and false doctrine today. You've heard the expression to choke a horse. Listen, there's enough error and false doctrine today in the church to choke every horse on earth. And then, and then whatever ones would have been born into the future to choke them also. Now, how does God feel about doctrine? Do you know that the, that the meaning of the word doctrine is the, it's, it's called the foundation of truth. We've got to have a foundation in our lives of truth to, to build upon. We can have a lot of great things up here, but we've got to make sure our foundation is sure and solid. First Corinthians tells us, Paul tells us, that no other foundation can be laid than that which is already laid, which is Jesus Christ. Our foundation must be Jesus Christ. It can't be warm fuzzies. It can't be the Shriners hospitals. It can't be benevolent societies. It, it can't be doing good. Because doing good isn't always good in the Word of God. Remember, God is not a science. Okay, science, one and one is two, two and two is four. Well, with God, it can be anything. God adds by subtracting, he multiplies by dividing. He's sovereign, he does what he wants. So error and false doctrine is something that the Word of God has a lot to say about. In fact, Paul goes so far here, starting in Galatians uh, 1, verse 6, Paul says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him, speaking of Jesus, that called you, uh, or God, speaking, uh, that has called you into the grace of Christ unto a foreign gospel which is not really a foreign gospel, even, uh, he says, but there are some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Jesus Christ. Verse 8, but though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which has already been preached, let him be accursed. That word means cut off and sent to hell. Wow. Wow. I wonder if he really meant that. Let's look at the next verse. As we said before, this is, this is done rarely in Scripture where, where a spiritual truth, because they're all great truths, 
but where a spiritual truth is reiterated. So Paul, this is how important this is for us. He says in verse 9, As we said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which you have already received, let him be cut off and sent to hell. Those are pretty strong words. That's how God feels about the foundation of truth in our lives. Our doctrine has got to be straight before the Lord. God does not care how we think about his doctrine or what we think about his doctrine. He does not want or need our ideas or thoughts about how to fix things. If, if we could have done that, we would have done that. Through all the different times, dispensations, whatever you want to call them, God, eventually at the end of time, God is going to stand before man naked. And God is going to, uh, I'm sorry, man is going to stand before God naked and, and have nothing to say because God's going to make sure that everything that man, any excuse that man could have ever come up with, Lord, if you just would have let me do this, we would have made it work. You know, if we just could have had this one world government where we could all be one and we could share and share alike. See, isn't it, and, and, and of course the empty heads think, oh, yes, if we could all just be one, share and share alike, and then we would have no strife and no contention. But see, what people fail to realize is that man is inherently evil, and man has a desire to conquer man. And so, of course, those, and I, I like to use the example of Al Gore, who, who, who is so against the combustion engine, you know, that's the one that makes your, your vehicle move. He is so against the combustion engine in your car, not his. Okay? And the majority, not all, but the majority of the Hollywood types that are just shaking their fist at, at your SUV are driven in limousines as, as, they, as, as the pomp and circumstance of their hypocrisy and witchcraft is, is paraded on TV amongst most. Hypocrites. They don't believe what they're saying. But that's all for another message. Doctrine is very important unto the Lord. 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Let's not be demon magnets. When our doctrine is not straight with the Lord, the devil plays pile on into our lives. Paul tells Timothy once again, now the Spirit is, speak is speaking expressly that in the latter times, brothers and sisters, we are in the latter times. Now if you're a preterist, if you're a manifest sons of God, uh, a word faith believer, you may not believe me when I tell you that we're in the end times, but, but you'll find out. We are in the end times. Uh, you know, th those boys, they believe that Jesus came back in 70 A.D., a lot of them. They believe that we're in the millennium at this time and that they're to prepare the kingdom because Jesus is waiting to be released from heaven. And until we take over the kingdom and Christianize the whole earth, which is still going to take us a few thousand years, they say, then Jesus can be released. See, it's up to us for Jesus to be released. Just so ridiculous. Just, just the doctrines are just so bogus. Uh, now the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times some shall depart or withdraw or refrain themselves from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits. These are imposter spirits or, spirit, or spirits that are imitating the Holy Spirit and doctrines and instructions of devils. Now that's, that's happening at this time. Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared or cauterized with a hot iron. Brothers and sisters, our conscience, when we become born again, our conscience once again becomes alive. It, it's, it's, it's the thing that the Lord uses to bring conviction, that the Holy Spirit uses to bring conviction into our lives. Our conscience looks, it, it, it evaluates a situation that's before us. It sees the good, it sees the bad. And then our conscience makes the decision to go towards the good. See, when our conscience is not born again, it does anything it wants. You know that human beings are, are worse than animals? Human beings will degrade themselves worse than any animal. God relates the, the soul of people, even in the born again believer, the soul the, uh, the mind, the will, the emotions on the same level of, of animals. You know, animals are not homosexual. You know, they stay with their own kind. 
not human beings. Human beings will defile themselves greater than any animal that's out there. But the Spirit is speaking to us that now in these end times, people are going to depart from the faith. Brothers and sisters, this is happening on a mass scale. There is a New Age teaching in the, in the church that we are Christ and that Jesus died spiritually and that God is raising up an army to, to overthrow the governments and, and, and people are just, because this stuff sounds good. You know, it's, it's, it's so interesting to think that Jesus uh, had to die spiritually to be, and that he was just about to die in hell as the demons were just piling on top of him and beating him up and kicking him and spitting on him and then God, God breathed into him the breath of life and boom, he came back, the born again man with the keys of hell and death and that's how he defeated Satan. And, and you know, when you get somebody who can speak well and explain this in a story, it sounds cool. Hey, man, hey, man, that's what Jesus did for us. No, Jesus said when it was finished, it was done. The shed blood on the cross paid the price of sin. The word faith believers or the word faith teachers do not believe that. All of them, all of them, from, from the erroneous demonic teachings of E.W. Kenyon, handed down to Kenneth Hagin Sr., who now knows different, have been passed on now down to, to Copeland and all the other word faith teachers that are out there believe that Jesus died spiritually. If, well, they teach it. I don't know what they believe. They may just, you know, whatever. But if they believe it in their hearts, every single one of them is lost. So I'd like to see them on an airplane sometime. I always, I always look in first class to see if I'd recognize, but then I found out they all have their own planes and, you know, <laughs> I mean, they don't even ride first class on the planes that I'm on. They're, they all have their own planes, so uh, maybe, maybe sometime I'll, I'll run into one. I'd really like to ask them questions, how they can believe this stuff, because you won't find it in the Bible. There's no reference to a lot of these doctrines. I mean, they, you can't even stretch to make them work. They just, but by the way, and this will come out in the message later on this afternoon, you know, people like Tommy Tenney and Rick Joyner, they don't care about the Bible. It's good, it's holy, it's necessary, but God's doing a new thing. He's doing more than the Bible today. Brothers and sisters, if you believe that, you are in rank error, and you really need deliverance from those spirits of deception that are ruling you. Because God is not doing a new thing today. God is telling us, as he's told us in Jeremiah, to get back to the old ways. See, the old ways are the right ways. Right. This new thing is nothing but, but cotton candy in, in the church. It's this big old hunk of cotton candy that when you bite into it, there's nothing there. Ooh, it's sweet, but you eat too much of that stuff and your stomach starts to turn. It's bad stuff. 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. We don't want to be demon magnets... Peter said, and, and this is, you know, if you really want to know how bad things are in the church today, just read 2 Peter chapter 2. Peter says, there were false prophets amongst the people, even as there shall be false teachers amongst us, who privately shall bring in damnable, destructive, disunion uh, heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and bringing upon themselves sw swift destruction. And we would think, well, there's no believer that's going to sit in a church that denies the Lord that bought them. If you believe that Jesus died spiritually, you deny the Lord that bought you. If you, if you believe in, uh, uh, in this extra-biblical teaching of Joel's army and, the, and, that, and that you can achieve immortality in your body, okay, you're denying the Lord that bought you. Jesus tells us, in, and this is one of the most important verses you'll find in the scripture. Write this down, memorize this one, plaster it wherever your eyes go most of the time. John 7, 37, Jesus says, believe on me as the scriptures have said, and then out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Jesus says we've got to believe on him as the Bible says as what the scriptures say, and then out of our lives shall come the Holy Spirit. We can't believe on Jesus as a church or a pastor or a videotape or an audio tape talks about. We've got to be alone with the Lord. Brothers and sisters, when we get home, our husbands and wives and pastors and, and videotapes are not going to be next to us. We're going to stand before the Lord alone. Now the believers 
Thank God for Jesus Christ. Our sins were judged at Calvary. But we will give an account of our lives of why we allowed certain things. That's why the scripture says there's going to be a lot of tears in heaven for a season. We're going to cry over the missed opportunities and the things that we allowed in our lives. But God doesn't want us to be a, a, what's called a demon magnet because verse 2 tells us in 2 Peter chapter 2, he says, And many shall follow their pernicious or destructive ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness, fraud actually is the word in the Greek, shall they with feigned fictitious words make merchandise of you. They buy and sell us. And of course, this is all over the television. This is all over the radio. The buying and selling of Jesus Christ in our lives. Now, there's nothing wrong with paying money for a book. But there's something wrong with giving money to ministries that tell you that if you, if you give them a hundred bucks, God's going to give you a thousand. Well, wow. Man, I've, I've missed it all these years. What a, as Gloria Copeland says, what a good deal. You give God a hundred bucks, excuse me, you give them a hundred bucks and God will give you a thousand back. <laughs> you try that. You, I'll tell you what, because they, they say that's called the seed faith. You, you sow your seed. The Bible says the seed is the word of God. Sow your seed to them. Tell them what the word of God says. But actually, all kidding aside, if you get a little short on your bills one month, write them. Say, hey, listen, how about a hundred bucks? God will give you a thousand. You'll never hear a word from them, brother and sister. You'll, they don't believe it. They don't believe what they're teaching. Through feigned words, through covetousness, fraud, um, they're, they're defiling us. And when we partake of that, we become, we become partakers of their sins. And we open ourselves up as Romans 6.16 6 tells us. I mentioned this verse last night, another very important verse that we should memorize. To whomsoever we give ourselves over servants to obey, his servants we are to whom we obey, whether of sin unto death or of, or of obedience unto righteousness. It's our choice. It's our choice. If we give our money to these heretics that are out there, you're promoting a false gospel. You are partaking in their sins, and God is going to have to deal with you just as he's going to have to deal with them. Don't give them the money. They sleep very well at night. They are not laying awake at night thinking of you. They may be laying awake at night thinking how they can get money out of your wallet or out of your purse. But they are not thinking about you. They do not care about you. They are liars. They are charlatans. They are hypocrites. And you've got the Christian carnival barkers out there in, in the form of Morris Cirillo and, and uh, who's the other guy? Um, um, who's the other one that's always barking about money? Bob Tilton. <laughs> He's just entertainment. Um, <laughs> Well, there's, there's several of them. Even Steve Muncy's now doing this. You see him. You see his mug all over uh, uh, so-called Christian television. Lying. Lying to people. God's telling him to tell you stuff. Listen, God's strong enough, big enough to tell you himself. We don't need these mediators between us and Jesus. And when we partake in their sins... When we get involved in these errors and false doctrines, we become like them. And we open ourselves up to these demons. And this is why the church has no power today. This is why the Lord's not in the majority of churches. He can't get in. He's like the story of the guy that, that came into the church one time and, and he was all kind of tattered and you know, he didn't look right and you know, hadn't had a bath in a few days. And, and uh, one of the elders from the church came up to him and said, you know, you know, brother, they got this church down the block that you know, would be a little bit better suited for you. And he started to cry and weep because he felt the Lord wanted him there. So he walked out the door and met this gentleman out there and, and this guy came up to him and said, what's wrong? Well, you know, I felt I was supposed to come here, and I, I guess they just didn't like the way I was. And, and all of a sudden, it was Jesus. And Jesus said, that's okay. I've been trying to get in there for years. They don't want me either. <laughs> it's happening in a lot of churches. Let's not be demon magnets and be partakers of other people's sins. When we are, we open ourselves up to the adversary, and then we believe a lie. 
And when we believe the lie, it's very difficult to follow the truth. God will bless. You know, God is such a gentleman. God is such, he's just so righteous. Whatever is right in our lives, he'll bless. We could have 99, as a believer, we could have 99% wrong in our lives. He'll bless that 1%. But he can't bless anything else other than what's right in our lives. That's why we need deliverance. The more the demons get out, the more the Holy Spirit works. The more the Holy Spirit works, the more he can move in our lives. It's this perpetual motion machine. The more we follow the Holy Spirit, the more he blesses us. The more he blesses us, the more we follow him. And it's just this big, you know, this big perpetual movement machine that is going forward. Uh, let's go, uh, let's drop down to verse 14 of 2 Peter chapter 2. Uh, we're starting to run low on time here. These people have eyes full of adultery. They cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls. Brothers and sisters, if you have an unstable soul, you need deliverance. Jesus Christ restores souls today. Your soul is your mind, will, and emotions. Peter writes to us earlier on, he says, abstain from fleshly lust at war against your soul. Satan is putting all kinds of fleshly lust. And listen, it doesn't matter if you're, if you're a believer or not a believer. It doesn't matter if it's good or bad. He doesn't care. If he can deceive you with good things, he'll deceive you with good things. It's just a matter of what we'll bite on. He says, having eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls, their hearts they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children. These are religious leaders that Peter is talking about. I wonder if any of these people are alive today. Verse 15, which have forsaken the right way and have gone astray following the way of Balaam, the son of Bosar, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. If, you don't, if we don't think that the ways, the doctrines, and the errors of, Balaam's are, are, of Balaam are in the church today, remember, Balaam, and, and here's, here's the trick, Balaam could not curse God's people. Right? Remember? So what he did is he taught Balak how to get the people to curse themselves. And since, and since the, the, uh, the unsaved birds in the pulpit, and maybe some of them are even saved, but since the preachers can't curse you, literally, they teach you how to curse yourself. That spirit is very much alive in the church today. And of course, he was rebuked for his iniquity. That dumb donkey speaking with a man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet. And these are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity or uselessness, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean to escape from them who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption because of, because of what a man is overcome, of the same he is brought into bondage. Again, I'm talking about error and false doctrine. We have got to make sure that our doctrine is straight before the Lord because when it's error, we are wide open to the demons. I mean wide open. There are so many believers you couldn't get another demon in there with a crowbar. They walk around like zombies, and, and, they're, and they're fragmented all over the place. They can't even find a Bible to read. Nothing satisfies them. The spirits of, spirits of never satisfied are ruling their life. They go from church to church, relationship to relationship. They go from Bible to Bible, friend to friend. It's an amazing thing to, to just watch people. Just they, they light here, they light here, they light here, they light here. You know, that's not Jesus Christ. Now, there's nothing wrong with visiting. There's nothing wrong with going to other places. But people are never satisfied. They can't find rest for their souls because they're fragmented all over the place. They're not there. And deliverance restores the soul. Literally. Our souls can be fragmented. Our souls can be given over through witchcraft. Ezekiel, I think it's Ezekiel, is it 8? Ezekiel 6 to Ezekiel 12, somewhere right around there. God talks about, about women out there that are using witchcraft to hunt the souls of his people. Uh, uh, Genesis 35 talks us about Shechem who laid with Dinah and, and some part of his soul, mind, will, or emotion, fragmented itself and attached itself to that gal. We can have good, we can have good soul ties, bad soul ties with people. Our souls, brothers and sisters, is the battleground, our mind, will, and emotion for the adversary. 
And that's why we need, what does the scripture say? Jesus wants to be what? The bishop and shepherd of our souls. We are to commit our lives unto him as, as a faithful creator, the word of God tells us. We are to learn of him so we can find rest for our souls. If you would, let's turn to Exodus 34. Exodus 34. Making agreements with, with ungodly things and ungodly people. Again, we learn people's ways. The old familiar verse that, that's quoted many times in deliverance, uh, Proverbs 22, 24, that we don't make friends with an angry man and with a furious person we should not go because we will then learn their ways and it will bring a snare to our souls. We open ourselves up to the adversary when we, when we fellowship with people that we shouldn't. Well, but they like me. <laughs> you can get prayer for that. <laughs> Listen, they're just some friends we don't need in our lives. I, I had that happen, and I, I probably could have years ago dealt with the situation a little bit differently, but the Lord had just started to touch my life, and, and I had a good friend, and I was going one way, and that person seemed to be going the other way, and I had to break the relationship. In retrospect, maybe it all came out the way it was supposed to, but I had, it, and it hurt me to do that. But this was just somebody that was detrimental to my spiritual growth and progress at the time. It wasn't something that I purposely set out to do. It was just a natural progression. But there are just some people we don't need in our lives. And he was a good friend of mine. And it hurts me when I think back on the whole situation. But listen, it's us and the Lord. And we're going to have to listen to what the Holy Spirit is telling us. Exodus 34, looking at verse 10, so of course is Moses letting the people know. He says, God's telling you, he says, I'm making a covenant with you before all the people. I will do marvels such as not been done in all the earth, nor in any nation, and all the people amongst which thou art, which you are, shall see the work of the Lord. For it is a terrible, it actually means wonderful, it is a terrible thing that I will do with thee. Brothers and sisters, this is us today. God wants to show his power in our lives. But we need to get our lives cleaned up so that that power can come through. Uh, I've used this example many times because it's the best one Pastor Worley used it. Our lives are like a pipe that water is flowing through. When the pipe is clean, the water can just flow right through. But, but after years or after time, it begins to get sediment and, and corruption on the inside and it closes and closes and closes in our lives and then the water just kind of trickles out after a while. Well, God wants to clean our pipes so that the Holy Spirit's power can come through our lives. But man, we live in a tough day, don't we? I mean, we live in a, in a day when everybody's stripping down and, and, and even, again, last night I, I, I got back real late and, and I was trying to do some reading and, and studying the, and, and I accidentally turned the news on, which I shouldn't have done because I'm a news hound, I like news. But right in the middle they had this commercial with these gals, that, that this is on Rabbit Air TV, that were stripping naked. They were walking around in their underwear. We live in a very tough world today. And that's why we need to stay as close to the Lord as possible. Because Jesus is the only one that's going to keep our eyes in our head. Jesus is the only one that's going to keep our minds where they're supposed to be. Jesus is the only one through the armor of God that are going to keep our feet shed with the, proper, with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And it's, and it's going to happen right now. How the Lord does that is in the church. I don't need any church. No, you don't really need any church, but show me your life when you're not in the church. Right now, the Lord's using the church. And by the way, the church is going back to the home. But we make these ungodly agreements, and so the Lord says, He says, I'm going to do marvels amongst you that, that have not been seen in any place on earth before. Verse 11, so observe that which I've commanded you this day. And if you do, I will drive out from thee the Amorite, Canaanite, Hittite, Pezzerite, uh, uh, Hivite, Jebusite, Hollywoodite, and take heed. <laughs> Take heed, though, to yourself, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land where you go, because it will bring a snare to you. You're to destroy their altars, break down their images, cut down their groves, for, the Lord, uh, for thou shalt worship no other god, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. God says, I am not going to share my glory with another. 
God is not going to share Jesus Christ with Mahat Mahadi. God is not going to share Jesus Christ with Muhammad and Allah. It is going to be Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. But the New Age Church embraces many different Christs, many different teachings. And we're just seeing the birth pangs now of this so-called new thing, this great ecumenical movement that is coming into the so-called body of Christ where we have to accept the Mormons and we have to accept the Jehovah Witnesses. You go to a Promise Keepers convention and you cannot witness... If you know that you have a Catholic on one arm and a Mormon on the other arm, you are forbidden to try and witness to that person to bring them to Christ. So I guess you just grease their slide to hell. We're all brothers. As long as we mention the name of Jesus, we're all brothers, right? John 7, 37. Memorize it. We've just opened ourselves up to a gospel that is not the one of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And, and we're demon magnets when we get involved in any of this stuff. It is not our responsibility to hold things together. It is our responsibility to look in the mirror of our lives and take care of the person standing in front of that mirror. Now, you may have another responsibility as a husband, as a wife. You may have a responsibility as a boss. And those things the Word of God also talks about. But our responsibility is about us and what we do in our lives, and what we allow in our lives. And these Hollywood hookers and everybody else that's trying to make these ungodly soul ties and mind ties and sex ties with us have no other motive than for you to buy that ticket to go to see them damn God and to speak profanity of Jesus Christ and to strip themselves naked. And we stand back and say, but I'm a strong believer, and that stuff doesn't bother me. Well, listen, we're going to be praying tonight for, for you. Because if we think that we can sit in front of something of people stripping themselves naked and hearing them damn this and F this and M that, we're already deceived. If every day you don't sit in front of that TV or go to a movie and it doesn't offend you more and more, your Christianity is going backwards. It's not that we don't do it, it's what we do with it. Listen, we all slip, we all fall, we all allow things. There's nobody here that's better than anybody else. But what do we do with that? When we walk out, do we say, Lord, help me. I don't need to see this trash. Do we walk out with our spirit grieved that things are that way? Listen, because we drop money for these things is why that, that business stays in business. Okay, uh, quickly, because we're just about out of time. Uh, if you would, write down um, Joshua 23, 11 through 13. Joshua just picks up the ball after Moses and says the exact same thing uh, in 11, 12, and 13. But again, the truth, the principle here is that we're demon magnets when we don't follow and do these things. And this is talking about specifically here making ungodly agreements with people and things. Also, if you would, Deuteronomy 7. Let's, let's turn there. Deuteronomy 7, bringing bad things into our house. You know, when I first came, came to the church here, uh, now I'm going to date myself, okay? I had a lot of albums, okay? Uh, just, it started with 8-track tapes. Uh, <laughs> And then, it went, and then it went to cassettes and albums. But I had a lot of bad music that, that I liked to listen to. And I had a whole bunch of this stuff in my house. When I came up for prayer, I was sitting right up front there, and Pastor Worley and several of the other brothers were praying for me. And demons, this has never happened since. It only happened one time. They were just all over on the inside. Weirdest thing I'd ever, because I felt them, but I didn't feel them. It was just kind of bizarre. And, uh, and after a little while, Pastor Worley... Uh, he stopped the deliverance, uh, and I was manifesting all over the place, but nothing was coming out. And he said, son, he's, I, I feel the Lord's telling me that you have rock music in, in your home, and I, and I did. And he, he didn't tell me what to do, but he told me that if I wanted deliverance, I was going to have to get rid of that stuff. He didn't tell me to get rid of it. He just told me if I wanted deliverance, I was going to have to get rid of it. Well, <laughs> after that experience, it was a no-brainer. I went home that night, I got rid of that music, and the next time I came up for prayer, I just went like a rocket, and I ended up looking like the carpet for several months. As, as the brothers prayed thousands, and probably 
tens of thousands of demons out of me. And the point I'm trying to make is that these things, these demons that were inside of me, my friends, okay, because I looked to that music as my friends, they, the groups, those groups understood me. So I had those ungodly agreements, ungodly soul ties with that music. Plus, a lot of them were into things that, you know, are just bad. And so having those things in my house brings forth the truth of Deuteronomy 7, verse 22. The Lord thy God is going to put out those nations before thee by little and little. That's how deliverance comes, by the way. So it can come in big sweeping moves, but a lot of times it's little by little because what the Lord does is he brings us deliverance and then he tests us. And once we pass the test, then he gives us more. He says, uh, uh, Thou mayest not consume them at once, lest the beasts of the field increase uh, upon thee. But the Lord thy God shall deliver them unto you, and you shall destroy them with a mighty destruction until they be destroyed. Verse 24, And he shall deliver the kings into thy hand. This is all really great words of encouragement. And thou shalt destroy their name from under heaven. There shall no man be able to stand before thee until thou hast destroyed them. And the graven images of their gods shall you burn with fire. You shall not desire the gold or, or the silver or gold that is on them, nor take it unto thee, lest thou, lest thou be snared therein. For it is an abomination to the Lord. Neither shall you bring an abomination into your house, lest thou be a cursed thing like it. But you shall utterly destroy it, or detest it, and you shall utterly abhor it, for it is a cursed thing. Brothers and sisters, when we bring ungodly things into our house, many times we can bring curses into our own home. And ladies, I'm not, because I'm out of time, I'm not here to pick on you, but a lot of these magazines that you bring into your home, you're bringing curses into your home. And don't worry, if I ever come and visit you, I'll never say a word. Don't worry about it. I'll, I, that's, that's between you and the Lord. Now, if you ever say, the demons are beating me up and I don't know why, I may mention something. But I, I mean, it's, so you don't have to, if the preacher ever comes over, you don't have to dust. You don't have to, there's just a lot of things I don't notice. They're, they're none of my business. So that's okay to invite me over, by the way. <laughs> but the, po the point I'm trying to make is that we bring ungodly things into our homes. We bring witchcraft into our homes. Listen, Satan, Satan has fed us a line of garbage for years. The things that we allow, listen, some of the, some of the so-called Christian books that you have in your home are curses from God. And you become a curse like that stuff. Beware of these books that are out there that are being pumped out by, by Rhema and, and some of these other, you know, Hagen's organization alone pumps out, oh, I forget, 20,000 a month of heresy, of ridiculous uh, false doctrine that is then spread all over the world. You know, the world sends missionaries now to the United States. We used to be the light of the world to send missionaries out. All, most of the missionaries we send out now are polluting the body of Christ with false doctrine and error. Let's pray. Father, help us. Lord, we don't want to be demon magnets. Lord, whatever may be in our lives, Father, the secret things that, that, that are down deep, Father, that we allow, whether through our eyes, through our ears, through us physically partaking in these things, mentally, spiritually, Father, we don't want these things, Lord, and, and maybe we're deceived. Maybe we're willingly ignorant, Father. Maybe, maybe we just like to do things that we shouldn't do. But, Father, we know that your word tells us that, th that this isn't right for us and that you have better things. So, Father, we ask that you would give unto us godly sorrow to bring, re so that to have, to bring repentance into our lives, Father. We ask, Father, that you would cast off from us, deliver us, Father, from uh, the spirit of heaviness and that you would clothe us with the garment of praise. Father, don't help us to... Find time, Lord. Help us to make time to fellowship with you in your word, Father. Bring brothers and sisters to us. Give us the money, the time, the effort that we need to come to deliverance churches, to fellowship, Father, to get help, to be a blessing, Father, so that we can do, as your word tells us, those things that you want us to do, so that we can be the men and women of God that you've called us to be. We ask this and thank you for this, Father, in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.